Welcome everyone to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association's virtual star party for August. Um, we will be uh, streaming this live to, uh, to Facebook and have a chat available so that you're able to ask questions as we go along and uh, we'll, be, we'll be on there to, uh, to answer them as well. Because of the weather potential here in Southern Arizona and uh, in Minnesota where, our, where the telescope is, we decided that this time around we would actually record the observing portion of this in advance so that we could hopefully guarantee that we had some clear skies. And so, uh, but we will be on the Facebook chat live with you to provide updates and answer any questions. So with that in mind, uh, I'm Jim Noel. I'm the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association's Star Party Manager. And, uh, and so we will, uh, we'll be uh, doing uh, this Star Party tonight. We have several other ones coming up, but I'm going to uh, now turn it over to Jim O'Connor and let him introduce himself. Hi, this is uh, Jim O'Connor. And uh, I've been in uh, doing outreach with Tucson uh, Amateur Astronomy Association. Uh, for about 23 years, and I uh, also uh, coordinate the uh, Grand Canyon Star Party on the south rim of the Grand Canyon for eight nights every June. And so I'm glad to be with you tonight, and let's see uh, what kind of adventures we can do. Hi, I'm uh, Bernie Stinger. I'm a member of the Tucson Club as well. I'm also a member of the Minnesota Astronomical Society, and um, uh, in the summertime, I spend my time up here in Minnesota, uh, being involved with uh, uh, the club up here. I'm currently uh, in the um, observatory of the Minnesota club. Uh, it's about 40 miles south of Minneapolis. And uh, my telescope is about 50 feet from here. Uh, outside the building, obviously, um, out where all the mosquitoes are. So this is a, a good place to be uh, in an inside location. Now, uh, let me show you what, uh, what the telescope looks like. I'm going to uh, show you an image of it. Um, you'll notice it's uh, on, on a big heavy tripod. Uh, this is a Celestron telescope. It's a C8, uh, eight inch uh, Celestron uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope uh, on a ADX mount. And the, uh, on the back end of the camera, uh, I have a camera, uh, it's a video camera, an astronomical grade video camera that uh, is made by Mallinckan. It's a DS10C TEC. What that means is it's a thermoelectric cooled 10 megapixel color camera. And that camera is feeding uh, through the cable, the blue cable coming off of it, back to my computer where I can manipulate the image um, and process it and make it uh, uh, more visible for you. Uh, so throughout the evening, uh, I'll be uh, showing you occasionally uh, of some uh, processing as well uh, as just the live image captures. Okay, so what we're going to look at first tonight is uh, the comet uh, Neowise. Now that comet's been in the news a lot lately because um, in the mid-July time frame it was basically um, visual, so you could see it with your naked eye if you had a dark sight, and you could certainly see it in binoculars and in uh, telescope. Um, if we have an update here when we're doing this uh, in August, uh, we'll let you know uh, as well on the uh, on the chat. But so from July to August, it's moved into the, uh, this kind of position right here. So where you can find it is uh, it's right kind of in between, um, just north of uh, Virgo. But what you can do is if you look up in the northern sky, northwestern sky, you'll find the Big Dipper. I'm kind of outlining the Big Dipper right here with my cursor. If you follow the handle of the Big Dipper, we have a saying that says arc to Arcturus. So if you arc around from the handle of the Big Dipper, 
you'll see a bright star over by itself, and that is the star Arcturus. It's in the constellation Guatis. Now from Arcturus, we have another saying that you speed to Spica or spike to Spica. So if you go straight down from Arcturus, down towards the horizon, you're gonna find another bright star in uh, the constellation um, Virgo, and that's Spica. About not quite halfway between Arcturus and Spica is where the comet's gonna be. And if you look right in here, um, so you can kind of see the two stars, the comet right here. It's probably going to require at least some uh, some fairly dark skies and a binocular or a telescope to be able to see it. Um, the comet is uh, is about 1.2 astronomical units from us, which is about 112 million miles, and it's heading away from the sun. The closest it got to the sun was 0.28 million miles, so it actually got pretty close to the sun back in. Uh, um, for a while back. Uh, the closest it got to Earth was July 22nd and 23rd when it was only 64 million miles away. So it's, you know, about two thirds of the distance from us to the sun. So uh, it's, uh, it actually got pretty close. Um, so Bernie's gonna go ahead and show you now uh, what the comet looks like uh, through the telescope. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, you should be seeing um a live image now uh, of the comet. Uh, this is, um, of course, through a telescope, so the quality of the image is certainly much better than what you're going to be able to visually see or, or even see through binoculars. Uh, but with a good telescope, you can um, you can still pick it up uh, fairly decently. Uh, you'll notice uh, it has um, not only a um, um, a, a nice sweeping tail, uh, but uh, the actual coma or, or central portion is quite stellar-like. Um, not all comets are that way. Some of them are more fuzzy. Uh, this one has a more distinct center section. Uh, and you'll notice it's also kind of, has kind of a greenish hue to it. Um, that is from uh, the trace elements of cyanide uh, and also uh, from nitrogen uh, that's that's being uh, boiled off uh, by the solar wind. Uh, so that accounts for the uh, the color uh, that you'll see um, in the, uh, the coma itself. Uh, um, it will reappear about seven, six to seven thousand years from now. Uh, so you probably don't want to wait up for it to come around a second time. Uh, but it is a reoccurring comet. In other words, it's in a, an orbit that sweeps out and comes back again. Uh, Jim? Just the thing I like to explain is where the name came from. Uh, the Greeks uh, have a word for hair named coma. So a comet for the Greeks was a hairy star. All right, so what we're going to do now is we are going to go take a look at a galaxy. So while Bernie's getting his scope on uh, this galaxy, I'll talk a little bit about it. So what we're gonna go to next is a galaxy called M85. Now, most of the brighter objects in the night sky, for those of you that have done star parties with us before know this, um, have designations uh, that were done uh, by Charles Messier back in the uh, mid 1700s to early 1800 timeframe. And uh, he was a comet hunter and he kept coming across these fuzzy objects. And so he didn't want to mistake them for comets. And so he started cataloging them. Well, in his optics, he didn't have great optics like we have now. And so they were just kind of fuzzy objects. Well, now when we look at them, they're some of the best objects in the sky to look at. So most of the amateur astronomers will look at um, the Messier objects. And so this is, uh, this is number 85 in his catalog. And this is, uh, so that's why we call it M85. Um, it's in the uh, constellation of Coma Berenices. It's uh, actually a lenticular galaxy. So here's, here's Virgo kind of standing uh, on her head. Coma Berenices is, uh, it stands for the um, Bernice's hair. Um, so like Jim was saying, Coma is for, for kind of like hair-like, like Comet was. So it's uh, almost kind of right in between these guys. And if we zoom in a little bit, you'll see, uh, see it's starting to come in a little bit. 
And this galaxy is what's called the lenticular galaxy. Um, so that's kind of a, a galaxy that's in between a spiral galaxy, which we live, the Milky Way galaxy that we live in is a spiral galaxy. And the, the Andromeda galaxy that uh, is the other big galaxy next to us is also a spiral galaxy. When Andromeda and Milky Way, we're in the process of merging together. And when we merge together in about 5 billion years, we will probably become what's called a uh, elliptical galaxy. And it's kind of just like a big ball of stars. You, the, the galaxy loses its structure. It doesn't have the nice spiral structure to it. And it's much, usually much larger. So the two galaxies, Andromeda and the Milky Way, both about 100 to 110,000 um, light years across, will merge into one and be a huge galaxy. Well, what happens with the lenticular galaxy is those, when those galaxies maybe make their first pass and they kind of stretch things out a little bit, and they screw up the shape of the nice spiral, but they're not quite an elliptical, then that's the, the lenticular part of it. And if you look uh, in the picture, and you might be able to see it when Bernie uh, gets the scope on it, there might be another galaxy in the same field of view. And chances are, maybe those two galaxies are in the process of merging, and they've already done that one pass. So that could be what, uh, what's going on. there. Um, M85 is 60 million light years away from us. So when Bernie puts the scope on it, and you look at the light, you are looking at the light of that galaxy that, that left the galaxy 60 million years ago. So it took 60 million years to get from that galaxy to our eyeballs at the speed of light. So 60 million years ago, what was going on here? Well, that's when the dinosaurs were going extinct. So about the time the dinosaurs went extinct is where this light that you're looking at in the galaxy um, started leaving that galaxy. It's about 125,000 light years across, so it's a little bit larger than our Milky Way galaxy. And it is in what's called the Coma Virgo cluster of galaxies. Um, we belong to the Virgo cluster. Uh, this one uh, belongs to kind of a both of them. It's kind of right in the middle. Bernie? Okay, so uh, if you uh, uh, see there on the screen, uh, this is M85. Uh, this is the galaxy that Jim's been talking about. And uh, also, uh, right up above it here, there is another galaxy. I'm not sure exactly which one that is. I think it's M100, but I'm not certain. And uh, we'd have to do a little star hopping in here uh, to uh, figure out exactly which one that is. Uh, but what I want to show you uh, is not so much M85, because M85 is, is not a very distinct uh, uh, galaxy. It, it's not one that has uh, uh, interesting uh, spiral arms like many galaxies do. Uh, this one uh, has a, um, uh, another star in it. Now, this star here, and this star over here, these, these white dots are, are stars within our galaxy. Uh, we have to look through the stars of our galaxy to see out to the distant um, galaxies that are out there. Uh, however, this star, the one just on the bottom, is actually a star in M85. And why is it so bright? because it is a supernova. It's a type 1a supernova. And it is exploding uh, right now, and it's giving off so much light from that explosion that we can see it as an individual point of light from that immense distance of uh, about 60 million light years. Uh, Jim, did you uh, have something to say about that too? Yeah, this is um, a supernova of this type, a type 1a, is not what we usually think of as supernovas, even though it's, that's the most common type of supernova. It's actually what happened was two stars were a binary pair circling each other. And the larger of the binary pairs ran out of hydrogen fuel uh, earlier. And it became um, what was called a planetary nebula and then became a white dwarf. Well, that white dwarf no longer acted like a star, so it didn't have any 
uh, wind pushing off of it. So its partner started losing all of its hydrogen to this white dwarf. And when the hydrogen rushed in so fast, there was no equilibrium. And so after um, a short time, when it got to about 1.4 times the amount of gas, it's a, a amount of mass that our sun is, it went in so fast, it ripped the hydrogen apart and it became a supernova, but not the kind of supernova we think of as a single star uh, blowing up. That's a type two. The kind of thing we think of as a supernova is a star that's so massive that when it uses up its hydrogen and then goes through other elements, it starts creating elements all the way to iron and it starts to collapse. And that iron actually causes the uh, uh, former supergiant star to blow itself apart and become a supernova. That's a different kind. It's got a different chemistry than this one does. So the one you're looking at right now, the type 1a is the most common type of supernova, but we don't think of it as a star that's stealing gas and, uh, from another star and becoming an effective vampire. And it's just blown itself apart. Yeah, it's uh, amazing when you can, you know, you look at something that's 60 million light years away and you're actually able to see a star within that galaxy that bright. That is absolutely amazing. By the way, the, the name for this supernova is SN2020 um, NLB. An exciting name, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> yep. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go look at some very old stars. So what we're going to look at is a uh, collection of stars called M13, Messier 13. It's also sometimes referred to as the Great Hercules Cluster. So what this is, uh, the, is a, it's a globular cluster is what we call them. And they're some of the very older stars within our Milky Way galaxy. So if you think of the galaxy as, uh, you know, the center of the galaxy where probably a third of the stars, maybe even more than that, are, are collected within our galaxy. Um, and there's a nice big bulge in there and lots of activity going on, new stars, things happening. That's kind of party center. As the stars start aging out and, uh, and get older and older, they tend to separate out of the, uh, the core and drift out either out in the arms or in the case of these globular clusters, they're still in near the center of the galaxy, but they separate themselves above and below this, the galaxy. So most galaxies, like our Milky Way galaxy is about 110,000 light, year, 100, light years across. Uh, but it's only about a thousand light years thick. So they're kind of like a DVD. They're, they're spread out, they're spiral, and they're very thin. Well, these globular clusters tend to hang out above or below the Milky Way galaxy. Now, um, the Hercules cluster is a magnitude six. So it's uh, actually um, right at naked eye. So if you've got a fairly dark site, you might be able to find it. Um, so what you want to do, we, we talked about... Uh, um, Arcturus over here in uh, Boati. So again, here's the handle of the Milky Way arcing over to Arcturus. If you go from Arcturus and you go up above uh, looking kind of straight up and go all the way to, up here to another bright star, this is a star called Vega in the constellation of Lyra. Um, and if you look, uh, I'm roughly about halfway between Arcturus and Vega, you're going to see a polygon of stars. It'll kind of look like a funky square. And that's the keystone of Hercules. Here's the outline of Hercules. Um, he's actually fighting uh, Hydra, which is one of Pluto's moons. And if you look uh, in this case down towards the, the horizon, down towards the west, this long line right here, when you're looking at this part of it, you zoom in a little bit, the globular cluster is going to show up about a third of the way along this line between these two stars of the uh, of the keystone. So uh, that's that's where you find it. Now the cluster itself is about twenty five thousand light years away. So the light we look at when Bernie gets the scope on it is going to be uh, twenty five thousand. That's what the cluster looked like twenty five thousand years ago. 
Um, the actual cluster is about 145,000 uh, light years across, or 145 light years across. So it's fairly, fairly big. Um, the nearest star to our sun is Proxima Centauri, part of the Alpha Centauri system, and it's 4.2 light years away. So within this cluster, the actual cluster from edge to edge, so if you look uh, on the screen now and you see the, the kind of the cluster from edge to edge is about 145 light years. And, there, and within that boundary, there's, there's several hundred thousand stars. So the stars are probably 500 times the concentration of what we have in our night sky. So if you were on a planet or on one of those stars, your night sky would just be filled with lots and lots of big, bright stars. The cluster is about 12 billion years old. So um, you think about it, our, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. The Milky Way galaxy is probably 12 to 12 and a half, maybe 13 billion years old. So these are some of the first stars that were born in the Milky Way galaxy. Bernie? Yeah, uh, the uh, M13 is one of my favorites. It's always a nice one to show at star parties. Uh, people get a kick out of it. The, uh, the star cluster is, I believe, the second largest of the star clusters in our sky, um, Omega Centauri being the largest one uh, down in uh, the constellation Centaurus, which is not visible here from Minnesota but we can see it from Arizona. M13 reminds me somewhat of uh, uh, either a big octopus or, or maybe a big spider. It's like, here's the body, and it almost looks like it has these arms arcing out of it that, and, and, a, and a tail coming back. That's how I kind of see it is when, when, I, when I see this star cluster and nobody tells me the number, just shows me a picture, it's immediately recognizable because of those those arm-looking um, uh, rows of stars that, that come out of it. The o mystery always was where did these things come from? Because their age is older than the Milky Way, even though they look like they're circling the Milky Way uh, in around the halo of the Milky Way. And rather recently, within the last decade or so, it's been pretty much determined that there are three sources. One source is it could have been the core of an older galaxy, a small galaxy that was taken over by the Milky Way. And it pulled all of the gas away, but these are the old stars that are around the core. And the way you tell that is it turns out that on some of these globular clusters, they have found intermediate mass black holes in the center. And that is a cue that this was a small galaxy. Um, the second thing that's interesting about them is their age is uh, about twice as old as, the, as our sun. So these things are only the medium size and smaller stars. All the bigger ones have gone supernova already that would have been in this cluster. So if you really get a get a spectrographic analysis of some of these stars, you'll actually see they're becoming red giants and nearing the end of their lives, but it'll be more benign. And the third thing, is uh, I'm gonna surprise Bernie and ask him if he can put his uh, indicator right about at the one o'clock position on there and see if you can see a shadow. There's a shadow that's got three arms. That's a propeller. That's a very interesting thing to look at in a telescope. When you look at that globular cluster, it's got a propeller right where Bernie's just a little bit to the left. There it is, there's the propeller. That's the Hercules propeller. Sure. Yep, that little, uh, you got one coming straight out on a radial line and then two down below it. It's a three-bladed propeller. Oh, okay. Huh. Interesting. Hadn't seen that before. Yeah, and the one uh, going up to the one o'clock position going up to the upper right is pretty obvious, but the other two are uh, a little more subdued because they're kind of blending yeah. with the light of the cluster. Yeah, when you see it, you usually can see it again, but it take, the trick is to see it the first Right. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So right in the center here, you know, there's a lot of stars we're just not seeing because of the combined light of the cluster. It's just they're not, we're not seeing the individual stars. All right. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go look at a double star or a multiple star, I should say. 
So what we're going to do is we are going to go up into the constellation of Lyra. So remember we talked about that a little bit earlier. If you look, uh, if you look what's on the screen right now, um, here's Hercules that we were just at, the clusters right in here. We had talked about Arcturus way down here and Vega right up here. Well, it's kind of interesting is right associated very close to uh, Vega is a uh, multiple star system. So I'm going to spin it around and bring it over here into the center. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And so, and you can actually see the star with your naked eye. If you look up in the night sky, and right now Vega is almost straight up, and you'll, you can kind of see Vega, and you can certainly see these two end stars over here. Um, so it's, it's the kind of the shape you'll see, but you can probably even see these guys as well. But if you kind of go from Vega and where we're looking, we're looking off towards, let me just zoom out here a little bit. We are looking out towards kind of the Northeast. So you're looking a little bit East, but Vega is pretty close to straight up. Um, but if you come down to the star down below Vega, and it's gonna form a triangle. So there's Vega, here's this first star in, in the constellation, and then here's the, the multiple star system. When you look at it, you, just with your naked eye, you'll see only one star. But when you put some binoculars on it, you'll probably be able to split it apart and see these two stars. And if you can put a good telescope on it, as you zoom in, watch one of these stars starting to get elongated and elongated and pretty soon, Voila, There's a, they're, they're each a pair themselves. So that's why we call it the double-double is because, and it's, it's Epsilon Lyra, and it's the double-double because this is a double star and each one of them is a double itself. Um, let's see if, uh, they're about 162 light years away and about six, uh, 0.16 light years apart. So they're actually pretty close together. Now remember our, the nearest star to, to the sun is 4.2 light years away. These are about 0.16 light years apart, but they will take, th these pairs will take a, a probably 100,000 years to orbit around each other. And it's a fairly young pair. It's about only about 800 million years old. So uh, it's in, you know, our sun is four and a half billion years old. So these guys are only 800 million years old. So they're, they're fairly young. Um, the, the one pair, which I think uh, is this guy right here. Let's see, no, it's Epsilon 2. This is one. This uh, Epsilon 1, uh, the pair of stars that I showed you earlier are 160 astronomical units apart. So when we refer to an astronomical unit, we're talking about the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which is 93 million miles. So rather than coming up with a large number, we just use that. So we call that 1 AU, 93 million miles. Well, these guys are 160 AU apart, which seems like a lot, but in star terms, those are actually pretty close together. And they take about 1,200 years to orbit around each other. Um, Epsilon uh, two is about 140 astronomical units apart, and they take about 600 years to, to orbit each other. They're about a magnif magnitude five to six, so they're um, roughly uh, naked eye, you can, uh, that's why I said, you know, if you look up there, you can at least, now you won't be able to split them out with your, your eye, but you can see them, you can see the combined light with your eye. And then try putting a pair of binoculars on them, and I'll bet you, you might, if you can hold it steady enough, you might be able to see um, the two of them. Um, and about half the stars in the night sky are multiple star systems. So Bernie, you can grab the scope whenever. Um, so our sun is, is just a single star. Um, but about half the stars in the night sky are two, three, four, five, six, multiple, multiple star systems. Um, so we're kind of unique. And so here's the live view from Bernie Scope. Right. It, it's uh, uh, a nice pair. Uh, they are so close to, to the same magnitude that it looks like a couple of eyes looking at you. Um, because of the very low magnification that I'm running at right now, um, and the reason for I'm running at a low magnification is so we can look at the larger objects, uh, like the globular cluster that we looked at previously, uh, that low magnification doesn't allow us to split those pairs. 
but each one of these bright stars is actually two stars next to each other. Uh, this one is uh, a pair that is up and down. Oh, here's a satellite coming through. Uh, and this is a pair uh, that go left and right. Uh, but like I say, they, um, uh, because of the low magnification, you really can't uh, uh, see them uh, as split. You need fairly high magnification. Uh, in fact, it's these, this pair is a very good measure of the quality of your telescope and of the eyepieces that you have as to whether or not you can split uh, these pairs apart. Uh, so you might want to try that. If you have a telescope, go to this pair and see if you can split these, uh, these two stars into their uh, constituent pairs. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I'll ex um, emphasize what uh, the other Jim had said and say that the sun is uh, an average star in always but one. It doesn't have a partner. But it did at one time. The su our sun originally formed as part of a binary pair, but the other star that it was part of, that it was a partner to, was more than eight times as big as the sun. So it ended its life very quickly in a supernova. The sun was far, our sun was far enough away just to get pushed at a high velocity away from it. And so you can see it if you do a spectrographic analysis of the outer surface of the sun, you can see the debris of a supernova that used to be its partner. So right now, the sun is solo, but it was born as part of a pair. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Jim. All right. Now we're going to stay on Bernie's uh, screen here, and he's going to show you what he goes through and how he uh, moves his telescope. And the next object we're going to look at is M57, which is the Ring Nebula. Right, so I'm uh, going to leave it. Uh, I'm going to leave the screen uh, running. It's uh, on a five second update. Uh, so you might see some streaks in the screen as the, the camera or the telescope slews over to the next object. Uh, so let me put that into the object database here, uh, M57. Seven and tell it to go there. And the telescope's on its way. Uh, you can see there's it's um, moving now. It's moving over to the uh, the next object we're going to look at. And uh, M57 is, uh, again, uh, the Ring Nebula. And the Ring Nebula is also another one of the, uh, uh, the very favorite objects to look at uh, for star parties because uh, it always brings oohs and ahs. Um, the, uh, oh, it's coming in very clearly tonight. It must be straight up. Look at that, Jim. I got two of the, I got the- Yep, uh, two you got them both. Yeah, cool. Yay. Told you I could do it. <laughs> um, nice oxygen ring. Yeah, it was a good clear, uh, good clear uh, sky tonight. Um, like I say, this has been a long time favorite of a lot of people. Let me see if I can clear that up even better. I'm going to uh, do a little stacking here. Uh, and this stacking is called average stacking so it's going not going to make it brighter it's just going to improve on the image quality uh, by removing some of the noise in the background uh, so it's in the process of doing that uh, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit uh, you'll notice on the ring nebula that uh, there are several different colors involved with the ring uh, the outermost uh, color is red. Uh, that is an uh, indication of um, ionized hydrogen um, and uh, some ionized nitrogen, uh, but mostly uh, ionized hydrogen that was blown off 
as the uh, outer atmosphere of that star uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, you'll also see uh, some blue-green uh, interior uh, of, of the ring, and that is uh, from ionized oxygen. So we know that that star uh, in its interior also had considerable amount of oxygen as well. Now, unlike a supernova where the whole star explodes, um, in this case, uh, when the star exploded, some of it is still there, some of it as a remainder. Uh, and you can see uh, the actual star that was the cause uh, of this ring right there in the center. Uh, that's the, uh, the central star. Uh, that star is uh, approximately 15th or 16th magnitude. Now, what that means is it's very, very faint. Um, and you need a fairly sizable telescope to be able to see it visually. Uh, with a camera, you can pull it in. Uh, to be able to see it with a scope, you'd probably need something in the range of, oh, maybe 18 or, or 20, possibly even a 22 inch uh, telescope to be able to see that, that central star. Um, and the very faint one just next to it is probably down in the 17th magnitude and uh, good luck ever seeing that. Uh, but anyway, um, and I've got one, I've got the two on the, uh, within the ring, the ring itself, Tim. I yep. pulled it off. You know what? I'm going to save that image. That is uh, probably the best I've ever done with that puppy. I think I'm selling my camera. <laughs> Are ya? Okay. Well, I've been That's trying to talk you into into uh, the DS series for years. <laughs> That's uh, Jim, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, the um, the reason that the gases are ionized is because those uh, set that central dot that used to be the star is only the carbon and a little bit of oxygen that was left at the end of its life. The hydrogen was making helium. Finally, it just wasn't much hydrogen left, so gravity started to make a collapse. The helium that was made started creating first carbon and then oxygen, and that was the end of the life. That made extra wind, blew all those gases away, so it wasn't really uh, an explosion, it was more of a sneeze. And so those gases went away and left carbon and some of the trapped oxygen behind. Well, the temperature was so high, over a half a million degrees at times, that it, uh, most of its energy was coming off as ultraviolet. Ultraviolet light ionizes gases that are that close. That's why you can see the ring. It's because of the heat of those central stars ionizing that gas and making it like a neon sign. Nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a gorgeous uh, image there. Um, this, the ring nebula is about 1400 light years away. So um, that's what you're uh, seeing. And the actual star, um, they think it um, went through its death throes about six to eight thousand light years, uh, six to eight thousand years ago. By the way, I, I noticed in the database that the ring is growing at the rate of one arc second per hundred years. Huh. Now, that is very, very small, but perceptible uh, change in the growth of the ring. And images of this that were taken, um, maybe not a hundred years ago. Yeah, they could have done it a hundred years ago. Um, but certainly images that were taken 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, in comparison to images that are taken now, actually show that slight growth. That's interesting. You can see it in just that short a period of time. So what, what you could say is that we've been talking about light years and one light year is six trillion miles. So you can imagine how far away that really is. At, and what happens is that thing is expanding outward at about 17,000 kilometers an hour. And it takes a long time to give enough distance to actually see that change, almost a hundred years to see the shape change. So that uh, it's a remarkable picture for that distance away. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm going to show you where that is in the sky. So again, before we were looking at uh, Vega, this is the constellation of Lyra, and we were looking at the, the double double right down here. Well, the other end of the constellation down here where these other two bright stars are, um, just about uh, halfway between them, maybe not quite halfway between them along that line is where the Ring Nebula is. So it's kind of right along that line in between the, uh, the two stars in the constellation of Lyra. So that's, uh, and that's kind of looking again, almost straight up right now. All right, so that was uh, the Ring Nebula. Now we're just gonna go just a little bit a ways away and we're gonna talk about an object in the constellation of Cygnus. So just below Lyra, is Cygnus the swan. And here you can see the outline of the swan. You've got the long neck and the wings going across. Um, Cygnus is also called the Northern Cross. So this would be the part, the up and down part of the cross, and this would be the cross piece. So we have a Northern Cross and the Southern Hemisphere has a Southern Cross. Also, it's kind of interesting is if you look up in the night sky, you're gonna see that the th three fairly prominent stars is this one at the tail of Cygnus, which is a star called Deneb, and then Vega, which we've already talked about up here in Lyra. And then if you come over here to Aquila the Eagle, down here uh, in the central part area is a star called Altair. And when you look up in the night sky, those three stars form what we call the Summer Triangle. And so that's Aquila, up to Vega and down to Cygnus. So that's the Summer Triangle. Now within Cygnus the Swan, there's a really cool star right at his head, right up here is his beak, and it's called Alberio. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. And now that we know where it's at there, Bernie, why don't you go ahead and uh, show him on the telescope. And so Alberio, it's a multiple star um, and right now the current theory is, you know, stars can be true binary or, or stars that orbit around each other, um, or they can be what's called an optical double, which means that from our vantage point, from our viewpoint, the way we're looking at it, it looks like a double star, but they're actually separated in, in different distances. And so, and they, they think right now that Alberio is probably an optical star. Um, and it's uh, the, the two stars, pretty significant difference in magnitude. Their magnitude uh, three is the brighter one and five is the, the dimmer one. So you can see, and you can see some gorgeous colors there. Uh, Bernie? Right. Uh, yeah, it does make a beautiful pair, uh, not only optically in a telescope, uh, but also uh, imaging as well. Uh, I hope you can tell uh, that the uh, the upper one has kind of a, a reddish gold color to it, uh, and the lower uh, of the two is definitely a nice blue halo uh, to it. So uh, a beautiful pair, uh, both visually and and imaging. Yeah, uh, the name of it is Alberio, and that means that's an Arabic word for beak, and so that's the beak of the swan. That's where the where the head of the swan is, and um, you'll find that if you start looking up the names of stars, it was decided in 1929 with cultures getting things mixed up of, among themselves, so you couldn't track scientific data. The International Astronomical Union says you're going to name all the stars after their Arabic names, except in a couple of specific cases, and that's because the Arabs were the first. Uh, being the uh, traveling uh, uh, merchants were the first that actually had over three to 5,000 stars named before the common era. So that's uh, generally you try to keep them with their Arabic name. That, na that name is Beak or Alberio. Nice. And these, uh, this pair of stars is uh, 380 to 430 light years away. So um, I, I assume one is probably kind of at one distance and the other one might be at the other distance, but, or they just haven't been able to nail down the, the distance very closely. That's why they think it's uh, an optical 
level. But the really cool thing in both in the camera and visually, if you look at this and visually and through a telescope, is the colors just jump out at you. They're, it's just such a beautiful pair of kind of blue, gold, um, amber, sapphire kind of uh, colors. It's a great way of showing to people who aren't familiar with stars that stars are actually different colors and they aren't all just white. Yeah, the color color is related to the temperature. So even though the blue guy looks a little smaller, the bluer they are, the hotter they are. So the more uh, the blue one is more irradiance than the yellow one, but it's farther away, so it looks smaller. And it probably has a much shorter lifetime. Yes. All right. So that's Alberio. Uh, now what we're going to do is we are going to cruise just a little ways away and look at another planetary nebula. So if you remember not too long ago, we looked at the Ring Nebula M57 uh, up here in, in Lyra. And I, uh, I just realized that I gave you the wrong distance. So I said it was 1400. It's, it's actually about 2800 light years away. So it's about twice as far away fr uh, from us of what we're gonna look at next. What we're gonna look at here is called M27. So it's the 27th entry in uh, Messier's catalog, and it's called the Dumbbell Nebula. So just like the ring, it's also a planetary nebula. Um, it's in the constellation of Vopecula, which is the fox, which if you look at the stars up in the night sky, all you see is a line of two stars. So I don't know how they got fox out of that, but they did. Um, so this is uh, Volpecula the fox and the uh, ring nebula or the dumbbell nebula is right in it. Let's zoom in a little bit. You can kind of see is it a fuzzy object there. Um, it's um, about uh, 1400 light years away. So it's about half the distance of the, uh, the ring, uh, ring nebula. Uh, magnitude plus seven. So um, like we talked about earlier, um, naked eye magnitude is about plus six from a fairly dark sky. So this one's just out of naked eye visibility, but certainly within binoculars, you kind of see a little fuzzy object, especially if you can hold it steady enough. Uh, and then in a telescope, they're just gorgeous. Now, the difference you're going to see if you ever, if you've ever looked to a telescope visually, um, you'll see, you'll see the shape of the dumbbell in the, in the eyepiece, but it'll look like shades of gray. Um, because our eyes, our eyes are just not sensitive enough because of the darkness and the distance to be able to see colors that well. So they have to be really bright or really big for us to be able to pick up colors at night. So what we see visually is we see shades of gray, but you can certainly see the outline of the dumbbell. In a camera, when Bernie puts the scope on it, you'll see the cameras are sensitive enough to actually pick up the colors within the nebula and the colors will all annot uh, annotate uh, different kinds of different um, elements, different gases within uh, the nebula. It's uh, about 3.2 light years in diameter. So a little bit smaller than the distance between us and uh, Proxima Centauri. So it's actually pretty good size. Um, it's you know about twice as big as, uh, as the ring nebula was. Um, let's see, a white dwarf uh, in the middle that, that is causing it. And we, I think we kind of talked about it, but, um, and maybe Jim, uh, when Bernie is done uh, showing the, the, the scope, you can talk a little bit about planetary nebulas in the sun, because I don't know that we've really covered that too much. Uh, and then it's uh, the white dwarf magnitude in the center is about a magnitude 13. So here it is on Bernie's scope. Wow, that looks great. Okay, uh, finally got it. Got a little tricky there. I, I wasn't sure I actually had it in the, in the field and then I realized that I had to do a much longer exposure on this one. Up till now, I've been using exposures of about five seconds um, for the objects we've been looking at so far. Uh, this one, I have uh, an exposure of 20 seconds, so it's it's a dimmer object, uh, but it's still well within uh, the grasp of the uh, the uh, camera. Now, like the uh, uh, the ring nebula, uh, you see colors here. Again, we're looking at 
red, which is ionized hydrogen, uh, and the blue green, which is ionized oxygen. Uh, and also, if you look dead center, that is the parent star right there in the middle that uh, is the cause of the ionization and the explosion that threw out all of this material. Uh, the, uh, uh, the ring is also one of the favorite objects for star parties. I'm sorry, the dumbbell. The, uh, the dumbbell has uh, an apparent uh, central star because it's much larger of a central star than most planetary nebulas. So this one you can see uh, in a telescope uh, if you visually try to look for it under a high enough magnification. Uh, Jim? Yeah, the, you notice the shape is quite a bit different than the, than the ring, and that's because every star that's out there has its own magnetic field. And when it gets to the end of its life and it starts losing its uh, uh, surface material, what ends up happening is it gets ionized from the heat of that white dwarf in the center, and that means it's manipulated by the magnetic field of the parent star. So every there's probably about 1,800, 2,000 uh, of these planetary nebulas in the standard catalog we would use at this time, and virtually every one is different. They all look different. And the way they get there is this is how the end of life of stars up to eight times the mass of the sun. If you get from, from just a little bit below the mass of the sun up to eight times as big, this is how you're going to end your life. Not with a bang, but with this kind of a sneeze where the, uh, um, the star starts to collapse because it's losing hydrogen, but then it causes a thing called a helium flash where the helium starts fusing and making first carbon and then oxygen. And that's, it, that doesn't last too long because it goes pretty fast, but it's a lot more energy. It makes it grow into a red giant because there's so much energy, but by growing into the red giant, it's blowing off its uh, outer gases and they're running away. And they stay hidden until that carbon that's left over, which is actually, uh, it's, it's supposed or it's guessed to have the crystal structure of a diamond on the inside. So it's got a little bit of oxygen in it and it's a space diamond. But if it's going to be anywhere from 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit to uh, a half a million degrees, you better wear gloves if you're going to go to try to grab that thing. And these white dwarves are generally about the size of the Earth when that used to be the size of a sun. Yeah, so that's what our sun's going to go through in about 5 billion years when it gets to the uh, end of its life and uses up all of its hydrogen. So, long ways away. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cruise a little bit further south and we are going to look at uh, another nebula, but in, in the last, the ring and the dumbbell were planetary nebulas. This is called a diffuse nebula. So this is uh, where instead of stars dying, stars are being made. And so where we're going is we're going to um, M17, which is uh, called the Omega Nebula. It's also called the Swan Nebula, uh, Checkmark Nebula, um, but it's kind of, it's a diffuse nebula because the, the gas is, it's kind of spread out and it's mostly um, ionized hydrogen gas and it is, a, it is a stellar nursery. So where we're looking is we're looking almost straight south and when you look down there in your sky, if you've got fairly decent skies, you're going to see two prominent looking uh, lines, sets of lines. The first one that kind of jumps out at you is Scorpius. And it actually, it's one of the few constellations that actually does look like a scorpion. And when you look down in the night sky, you'll see three, uh, line, three stars kind of in a row that's uh, signifying its claw. And then you come down here, you're going to see a really bright star called Antares, and that is the heart of the scorpion. And then you come down here, and it kind of hooks around, and this is the tail of the scorpion. And if it's high enough, and you've got a low enough 
horizon, you can actually see the entire hook. Sometimes the, the tail gets cut off because of the horizon. Um, and then uh, and they also sometimes they'll call this the fish hook because it kind of hooks around. But this is Scorpius. But this isn't where we're looking. If you go just to the left of Scorpius, you're going to see um, Sagittarius. Now Sagittarius for us, um, you can't really see the, the half person, half uh, animal, half horse. Um, what you can see is what we call an asterism. And when you look down there, you can kind of see an old fashioned tea kettle. One that you would set on the stove um, that uh, maybe your grandma would used to um, heat water with. And so here's the handle of the teapot. There's the lid. There's the spout. And here's the bulk of the, the main body of the teapot. So we call this the teapot. When you're looking in this area of the night sky, you're actually looking back in towards the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So if you were to envision steam coming out of the spout, just kind of rolling up here, this is the center of our galaxy. And if you've got some dark skies, and sometimes if you look up in the night sky and you got some dark skies in the summer, you can see this band of clouds. It looks like a band of clouds going across the night sky. That's actually the next arm of our Milky Way galaxy in towards the center of the galaxy that you're seeing arcing across. It comes out of Sagittarius and it moves across the uh, east and up towards the, the north and, and the west and over to a constellation called Cassiopeia. And so that, that arm that you see is gas and dust and stars and sometimes there's some dark areas where it's you can't really see any stars coming through and that's where the heavier dust is blocking the starlight from behind so it looks black to us well there's so obviously there's a lot of really cool things and we love looking down in Sagittarius so one of the ones that Bernie's going to put the scope on here in just a minute is called the uh, um, Omega Nebula so it's, uh, it's about a magnitude six. So it's, uh, it's a very colorful one. And Bernie, you can uh, show it from the scope whenever you're ready. It's- Yeah, uh, I'm just about there. All right. It's uh, five to 6,000 light years away. So it's not all that far away. And it's about a 57 light year diameter. So it's a uh, fairly good size, um, but you can see some uh, gorgeous color in there. Uh, and I, like I said, it's, it's actually in the, the arm, the Sagittarius arm that's in towards the, the next arm in towards the center of our galaxy. Bernie? Yeah, the, uh, the Omega is, uh, as Jim was mentioning, is in Sagittarius. Uh, the Sagittarius area is um, one of the favorite areas for amateur astronomers uh, because of there are so many objects there, and we really look forward to to uh, summertime uh, when Sagittarius rises. At least here in the northern hemisphere, um, when it rises up, and and uh, we can reach these uh, beautiful objects. Um, and M17 is certainly one of them. Uh, it, it's uh, one of its names is the Swan, and uh, it doesn't look like a swan too much in that way, but let me see if I can rotate that a little bit. And, um, uh, and let's see if we can um, uh, make that look a little more appealing. So I'm going to stop the image here and let me see if I can rotate it. And, uh, and I'll start another image. Bear with me here. I've got have to uh, tell the system to uh, re-image it now to uh, get it to rotate. And now I should be able to see the swan a little more clearly. Uh, it was an upside down swan. All right. Now we have got a swan. See, here's the, here's the here's the water. Not perfectly flat, but here, here's the water line. Here's the swan's body. All right. Here's the swan's neck. And this would be the swan's head uh, back over here. So there's our swan swimming in in the lake of this of the sky. Jim. Yeah. The um, the, the reason that the uh, gas is ionized is because there's about six to eight hundred stars you can't see. 
that are very, very bright. They're, the thing that makes the swan's neck is actually a dark nebula. It's actually a lot of dust, and the brightest stars in the swan are behind that dust. And the only way you can see them is with an infrared, uh, right, in an infrared camera. And those those uh, stars that are behind there are putting out so much energy, it's ionizing the hydrogen gas in that field around them. So it's kind of interesting that the thing you can't see is what's causing all the good stuff <laughs> that, that you see over there. And you can tell that when you get, as Bernie has as, uh, zoomed in a little bit, it's shedding a lot of feathers around there all around the place. Yeah, it's a, I always thought this was the the swan swimming so fast it was leaving a wake effect. It could be, <laughs> but yeah. this is really it can, it's a, a dispersed nebula and it's also called an emission nebula because it's giving off that hydrogen beta um, is the red uh, the beta form of hydrogen is coming out at us. It's the red ionization. Yeah, it's a gorgeous one to look at, uh, especially in uh, cameras some beautiful colors. Okay, so we're gonna stay on with Bernie again on this one and he's gonna show you the movement from M17. We're gonna go over to M20, which is called the Triffid Nebula. So it's gonna be another nebula not too far away. So I'm going to uh, drop my exposure down to five seconds and zoom back out again. And now uh, we're going over to the mount and telescope control software and telling it to find and move over to M20. And we're on our way. So you're going to see those streaks in the image again, like you did before. Uh, as the as the uh, telescope and camera um, move over to that object, and very faintly in the center there, you can probably start to make it out. Um, so I will need to do a much longer exposure, probably try about twenty seconds. So I'm going to quadruple. The exposure time uh, to see if that brightens up a little bit. It's just uh, just noticeable right about here. You can see portions of it starting to show up. So this should help a lot. For these kinds of bodies of extent, you can't press the magnitude because when they give you magnitude, that means the integrated magnitude or the sum of all the light across it. So when you get a big cloud like this beautiful object, it's really got low surface brightness and that's what your eye sees. So if, if it says it's a magnitude five and you go to think and you can see it with your naked eye, if it's not a star, you're not gonna see it because it's it's diffuse. I, I increased my exposure to 30 seconds. I think that'll help. Um, so we'll try a little bit longer of an exposure here. Yeah, it's actually showing up pretty nicely. Yeah, it is. It's starting to really come in, especially the dark nebula really sp splits it up nicely. There we go. That's better. There you go. Now yeah. we can make it out. It's getting um, crisp. M20 is called the, the Triffid Nebula. And for good read, uh, some people call it the Trifid Nebula, meaning tri or three. And the reason for that is because this nebula shows the three main types of nebulosity. Uh, you have emission nebula, which is the, the reddish ionization here. It's uh, the blue, which is, which is reflection nebula. Uh, it's reflected blue light from hot blue stars in that area. And then you have dark nebula. That's the the dark bands that are uh, bisecting and trisecting uh, the, uh, uh, the the red section of the nebula. And I think I see a little bit of, uh, yeah, you can see a little bit of these cones uh, of, uh, uh, of gas in the, uh, on, 
the nebulosity as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jim, did you have something? Yeah, just briefly, uh, this is in an area of the sky that's very rich in good things because we're looking right into the Milky Way. And as a result of this being a rich area, um, if you look at that teapot that we, we looked at earlier, Sagittarius, look right over the spout of it, and you'll be actually looking at the dead center core of our galaxy. And you can tell it's the Milky Way. Look at that rich star field. Yeah, there's just lots and lots of stars in there. Yeah, it's really thick in there. So this is where we were looking at. So like Jim was saying, here's the teapot again. Before we were looking up here at the uh, a Swan Nebula or Omega Nebula, we just moved just a little bit down here. So we're still in the central area <clears throat> of, the, of the Milky Way, right off the teapot. Here's the spout coming up, so there's the steam. So we're looking basically right dead center, right in towards the center of the the, the galaxy, the Milky Way, and that's uh, <clears throat> that's the Triffid that we were looking at. All right, so now what we're going to do is we are going to take a look at some planets. So if you look over towards the east, fairly high up, actually southeast, because it's they're they're not too far from Sagittarius. So here's the teapot and Scorpius we were looking at. If you look right over uh, just to the left of the teapot, you're going to see two bright objects, and that's Jupiter and Saturn. And actually, Pluto, so we have three planets in here. Pluto, you can't see in here, is probably right about here, so it's fairly close to Saturn. Pluto is, and we'll talk about uh, Pluto here in a minute, but Pluto is really tough to see even with telescopes. It just shows up as a star, and you have to kind of do a little blink back and forth, take some pictures, and see which star is moving to, to tell. Um, but Jupiter and Saturn, we're going to take a look. Um, Bernie's going to try uh, to see what kind of images he can get of both of them. We'll look at Jupiter first. And uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of tweaking. Planets are tough because they're so close um, compared to the stars. And they're not a point source that they can very easily be affected by our atmosphere. And as you can see, neither one of these are very high. So what happens is, you know, most of the time, as astronomers, we want to look straight up. We want to look as, as high as we can because we're looking through the least amount of atmosphere. Um, we're getting up above the atmosphere. And that's why you'll see professional observatories up on mountaintops because they want to get above as much of that atmosphere as possible. Short of sending space, you know, telescopes out to space, which is ideal, and we've got several out there. But if you can find a high uh, mountaintop and get above most of that atmosphere, you can have much clearer seeing and visibility. But in this case, they are kind of low, um, so we don't have that option. So they, they, they'll look a little bit fuzzier than if they were almost straight up. And sometimes you can get some really good, good views of them. Jupiter is the, the largest planet in our solar system. So if you think about uh, the make of the, of the system, solar system, we've got the four inner planets. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We're all the rocky planets. And then you have the four outer planets, with the, which are the gas giants or the ice giants. Well, in between Mars and the start of the outer planet, which the first one is Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt. So we have leftover material from the formation of the solar system um, in a belt around um, the sun and it's in between Mars and Jupiter. So Jupiter being the biggest kid on the block, it's uh, fairly, it's, you know, it's large. It's, uh, um, it's the largest planet in the solar system, but it also kind of helps stabilize the uh, asteroid belt because it's on the outside of it. So it, the sun's gravity would be wanting to pull a lot of those asteroids in and Jupiter can help us keep those um, out like that. So it's kind of our big brother in that respect. Um, but then sometimes Jupiter can have a tantrum and it can start, you know, spitting things and throwing things into the inner solar system. Um, so sometimes it's not the, the best big brother, but most of the time it's, uh, it's pretty good and it helps us out a lot. And when you look at, uh, at Jupiter through a telescope, you'll actually be able to see um, the cloud bands going around Jupiter. You'll be able to see four of its moons. Jupiter has 79 moons, so you know we have one. Mars has two. Mercury and Venus don't have any. And then you really jump up when you get to Jupiter and Saturn. So Jupiter's got uh, 79 moons. Of the 
six largest moons in the solar system, Jupiter's got four of them. The four you see in the telescope are all, um, well, all three of them are larger than our moon. And one of them is just slightly smaller than our moon. Our moon is fifth largest, and then Saturn's moon Titan is second largest. So um, um, Jupiter's largest moon is the biggest, and then Saturn's is second, and we're, uh, we're number five. Um, so right now, and they take a long time to, to orbit uh, the sun. So like Jupiter is, takes, uh, Jim, do you remember how long it takes to make one orbit around the sun? It's like, it's quite a ways. Yeah, I was thinking 279 years, but that might be one of the outer, that yeah, might be Saturn like, instead. Like 68 or 69 or something. Yeah. It, something like that. But it moves kind of slow. Saturn is uh, is twice for So Jupiter is about, on average, you know, 450 to 500,000 uh, miles away from, or a million miles away from us. So it's uh, it's out there quite a ways. It's, uh, it takes a while to uh, to get there. Um, yeah, the four moons that we're going to be able to see is Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa. Those are the four big moons. All right, Jim, you want to add anything else on Jupiter while we're waiting on Bernie? Yeah, real quickly, I'd say that uh, up until we started finding exoplanets, we thought that uh, the way the planets are now was pretty much the way they were formed. And uh, when we started looking at exoplanets, we found that the big gas giants we were finding were all uh, closer to their stars than Mercury is to the sun. And so we were puzzled about that for a while. And then we had to go back and look at the genesis of the, of the stars, well, how the stars were formed. And what we, said, what we discovered was that when the universe first started forming stars, there was no debris around. So the hydrogen formed of big stars and they went supernova real quick. Well, that was called population three. Then came population two, which was a little bit of that junk that was left around mixed in with the stars. And now they can start forming some planets. Things could form around them. And then we get to us. We're less than a third of the length of time since these planets started forming. Uh, our life at only four and a half billion years uh, that we've been around, we're in population one. And that means there is so much stuff around, we can form a lot of planets. So what they thought was, well, maybe Jupiter formed real close to the sun and it started moving because of the mass of all the junk that was around the sun. Uh, it was acting like a breeze pulling it. And when it did that, that's called the Grand Pack model and the sun uh, and Jupiter moved out there. Then they came up with a third uh, or a, a different version that I'll wait until after Bernie shows us uh, Jupiter to go through. Okay, so here is Jupiter. And uh, as you can tell on Jupiter, um, you, uh, there are uh, bands uh, across the, uh, the, the face of the planet. Um, there are several uh, bands. The most obvious ones are the, what are called the equatorial bands. And uh, you'll also notice it's, it's, uh, it's kind of fuzzy, it's hard to make out. And th that is uh, because you're, you're looking at it through an imaging camera. And although imaging cameras do a better job of looking at astronomical objects than the human eye, in the case of planets, they actually don't. Uh, they don't see them as well as the human eye. So if you've ever looked at a, at a, a planet like Jupiter, uh, with your, uh, uh, through an eyepiece on a, on a telescope, you'll, you'll see it much clearer than this. And the reason for that is because an imaging camera looks over a period of time and your eye looks and, at very small increments of time. So the human mind blends in uh, those small increments of time into a clearer picture, but the camera can't do that. It's not smart enough to do that. However, uh, there are software programs that can accomplish that. And how those work is you take a bunch of images like this, a, a movie or a bunch of stills, and you 
process them through the imaging software uh, and it spits out a much clearer image. And let me show you an image that that would look like. So here we have uh, an image of Jupiter that is much clearer that was done by processing images or video of that more unclear imaging that I just showed you of Jupiter. And here you can clearly see not only the, the multiple bands on Jupiter, uh, but also some of what's called the festoons along uh, the, uh, uh, the equatorial belt, and also uh, very clearly uh, the great red spot. And off on the left side here are a couple of the, the moons of Jupiter as well. Not sure which ones, but uh, those are two of Jupiter's moons. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's uh, obviously a lot clearer than what you're getting in real time. And like I talked about earlier, you know, both Jupiter and Saturn are fairly low on the horizon, so it's really tough to get a nice clear. I'm going to back off uh, the, on the image and then increase the exposure time uh, to show you uh, the moon. So I'm going to overexpose uh, the planet itself and here are uh, three of uh, Jupiter's moons, which means uh, the fourth obvious one is either going in front of it or around behind, and you can't see it right now. Europa, Io, Ganymede are the three that we're seeing. And the other one must be uh, going, uh, either behind or in front of it. Right. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and jump over to Saturn. All and right. while you're um, doing that, yeah. I will talk a little bit about Saturn. So if you remember what I showed you earlier on the planetarium program, Saturn is just slightly to the left of Jupiter, but it's about twice as far away and it's about half the size, but a lot smaller. So within Jupiter, that ball you're seeing on the screen right now, you can put 1,300 Earths in there. With Saturn, you can put 700 Earths inside. So it's, like I said, about half the size of uh, Jupiter, and it's about twice as far away. So Saturn uh, Ooh, is, is generally, oh, well, there it is, yeah, generally about a billion uh, or 900 million uh, miles away. So it's uh, almost twice as far away as, as Jupiter is. Um, when, when, the, or when they looked at it with early telescopes, they, they saw kind of an elongated image just like this, and it looked like it almost had ears on it. And so, uh, um, you know, until you got better optics, then uh, you couldn't really, you know, zoom in and be able to really get the, the nice clear image. If you ever, ever get a chance to look at Jupiter or Saturn in a telescope, visually or through uh, with uh, imaging or camera, definitely do it. It's, they're both spectacular visually. Um, but we get a lot of comments when, we, comments when we're looking at Saturn that it looks like a picture because the, generally the rings are so clear. Sometimes you, there's a gap in between the main A and, and B ring called the Cassini division. And a lot of times you can uh, you can see that gap uh, in there and visually, so that's kind of cool. Um, Saturn just not too long ago, maybe a year, year and a half ago, eclipsed Jupiter for the number of uh, moons. They now say Saturn has 81, so it jumped about 20. Uh, generally speaking, any object that gets close to Saturn or Jupiter either crashes into it or becomes a moon. So they have lots of small little irregular rocks around there. Go ahead, Bernie. Yeah, I've uh, left it overexposed uh, to show you some of the moons to start with. So uh, this one, that one, that one. And if you look right on the very edge of the glow there, you can just make out another one right at the bottom. There's yeah. one just, just peeking on the side. So those, that's four of Jupiter's many, many moons. Um, four of the brighter ones, obviously, 
Uh, this one, uh, no doubt, is Titan. Right. Um, because it's the brightest, it's always the brightest, it's the largest and um, most, e uh, most easy to identify. So having done that, let me back off on the exposure and let's see if we can pull those, those rings into view. There it's coming into view. You gotta, you gotta hit it just right. If I go too far, it just washes right out. Yeah, both Jupiter and Saturn are very bright because they're just, they're gas giants. They're made out of uh, basically uh, hydrogen and helium gas. And so they're very reflective. And again, like Jupiter, um, the, uh, uh, the image on a camera is, is distorted and fuzzy and uh, difficult to make out. Uh, obviously, you can see the rings, um, but um, visually, if you look through an eyepiece, uh, this will look much, much better. Uh, it's, uh, uh, again, an artifact of the fact, the fact that a camera looks over time versus the human eye uh, that looks at, at a much shorter time frame. Now, um, let me show you an image uh, that I've done of Saturn after it's been processed. So let me see if I can find that. Sorry. There we go. There it is. So here's a, pro a more of a processed image of what you just saw. Uh, where now you can make out the individual rings. Um, you can see the, the outer ring and one of the inner rings with the, uh, this gap. This gap that goes all the way around is called the Cassini division. And, uh, uh, and then also on the planet itself, uh, you can see uh, banding. Uh, these are bands very similar to uh, what you saw on Jupiter. Uh, they tend to be around the equator, uh, but there's several that are closer to the poles as well. So just a, an example of what post-processing software can do uh, to bring, up, bring out detail uh, that's not visible uh, by looking at this kind of image. So those are the two biggies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was pointing them out in Stellarium, and I don't think I ever mentioned the name of the program at the beginning, but the planetary program we're using is called Stellarium. Um, and it's a free program. So you go to just stellarium.org and I'll show you a slide at the end uh, that'll kind of give you the name and everything. But you can download it to your PC or your Mac and, uh, and use it. Um, so um, in between Jupiter and Saturn was Pluto. Now, obviously being able to look at uh, Pluto in, uh, in through the telescope's not gonna work very well. So what we did is we grabbed one of the images that was taken from NASA's New Horizon. So this maybe is- Maybe Pluto. we should explain why it won't work very well, Jim. Because <laughs> it's really, really far away and it's really, really small. <laughs> and far, way beyond the capability of my eight inch telescope. Yeah, yeah, you'd need to have like a Hubble or a big, uh, a larger telescope anyway, to find it. Now the way Pluto was discovered, it was discovered back in 1930 by a guy by the name of Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell Observatory up in Flagstaff. And what he was doing is he was taking images of the night sky and he, and he used photographic plates. So he'd, he'd take the image and it'd be on a glass plate. And then he would use what what's called a blink comparator. And so what you do is you take an image of uh, the sky where you might think something is because he was looking, they were looking for a a planet out there. They thought there was one out there. And so he'd take one and then maybe three or four days later, a week later, he'd take another one. And then he'd go back and forth between these two plates. And what he'd be looking for is any star that, or any object that would move between those two plates. And that would either be probably an asteroid or a planet. 
And that's how he discovered Pluto. Now we can do it with computers. We've got professional telescopes that are doing all sky kind of surveys. And they'll, over the course of a night or two, they'll take, they'll image the entire sky and then they go back and image it all again. And the computers are looking at the images to look at things that are moving and looking for near earth objects, asteroids, comets, planets, anything that's moving within the solar system is gonna show up because most of the stars, all the stars will, will stay fixed within, uh, within that particular um, shot. And so anything that's moving is either gonna be a planet, an asteroid or a comet or, or something like that. Um, so Pluto is very far, um, Pluto was demoted. It used to be the ninth planet. Now it's called the dwarf planet. They think uh, Pluto has uh, kind of a weird orbit compared to the other eight planets. It's very elliptical and it's very inclined to the plane of the, of the solar system. So most of the planets are gonna orbit around in the same kind of plane that the sun does. Um, but Pluto is very inclined and goes very elliptical. So they think that most of the objects beyond Pluto that they've detected have this similar kind of orbit. So they're called Plut Plutoids. Um, and so what they think is, Pluto is the largest right now that we've seen and the closest of objects in what's called the Kuiper Belt. So that's a belt of short period comets and, that, and then asteroids and other, there's probably large planets out there that we just haven't found yet um, that kind of extend out, uh, let's see, they go probably about, probably out to about 50 AU or so, astronomical units or a little bit further. So Pluto's orbit by itself varies from 30 astronomical units at its closest out to 48. I remember an astronomical unit is 93 million miles. That's the distance from the earth to the sun. So it's 30 to 48 times the distance of the sun. Right now it's 33 AU. So it's still fairly close. It's on its way out to its furthest one. So it's, it's gonna take a while to, to get out there. It's on a uh, 248 year orbit. So it takes uh, a long time to make one orbit. Uh, when when uh, New Horizons, so New Horizons flew by Pluto in 2015, um, and they took pictures as it was approaching, and they took pictures as they went by, and the New Horizons kept going and is, and is on a destination to another Kuiper Belt object further out in the, in the Kuiper Belt. Um, but these are the images that it took, and, and they also imaged uh, the five moons of, of Pluto. So um, Pluto's, Pluto's about half, I think it's about half the size of our moon or about a, probably about a third of the size. It's uh, 14, almost 1500 miles in diameter and our moon's about 2200. So it's fairly small and it's really far out there. And so that is Pluto. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to take a look at our next object. which is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. Let me type it in. Now this one has a lot of the stuff we were looking at before had an, a Messier number. This one has an NGC number. So this is NGC 6543. Now this one's kind of small, so I don't know if it's gonna show up too well or not. We'll see. I got it. You got it, okay, cool. So it's in the constellation of Draco. So we're looking, now we're looking towards the north. Um, you've got, here's the Big Dipper again. And then um, one way to find Polaris and the Little Dipper is once you find the Big Dipper and you find the bucket, these two end stars always point to Polaris, which is the North Star, and that's the end of the Little Dipper. And then if you go from the, it's the handle of the Little Dipper, and then there's the bucket. Nor most people can see Polaris and maybe these two end stars. Just above the cat's eye is, uh, or above the Little Dipper is called uh, Draco, and that's where the cat's eye is. So you can go ahead and grab the screen, Bernie, and let's take a look at it. Yeah, this is uh, uh, a very nice little planetary nebula. Uh, it has a lot of swirls in it, and, um, uh, and a very pleasing blue color, uh, which I'm assuming uh, has a lot to do with ionized um, uh, um, oxygen. Uh, the uh, central star is also uh, very apparent in the center, so uh, that that makes it uh, uh, another um, another value in in looking at it as as a 
uh, as a celestial object. Why they call it a cat's eye, I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably because it's kind of long and narrow. Um, and it has uh, uh, some interesting uh, interior uh, objects in it. I'm not sure what they are. Let me see if I can uh, improve on that a little bit and um, make that a little easier to see. I'll do a little stacking on it and see if that cleans it up a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the, one of the reasons they call it cat's eye is because it's got the very intricate uh, patterns that you, if you look intently into a cat's eye, there's a lot of different shapes and patterns within the eye and, and structure to it. And I think that's kind of why they call it the cat's eye nebula. It just looks like Yeah, it seems to have like four little lobes there on right. the, within it. Yep. Hmm, interesting. Like, uh, Bernie said it's a planetary nebula. It's, they're fairly uh, young stars. Um, about 3,000, 3,300 light years away, just outside of uh, of naked eye. It's about plus eight, so it's barely dim. Okay, um, so let's go to the next one. Let's see if we can get Andromeda. So here's the constellation of Andromeda. And if you look, uh, let's back off a little bit. Um, so we're looking kind of to the east. Uh, it's probably pretty low on the horizon yet. Um, and and what a lot of people can see the square, of, we call this the Great Square of Pegasus. It looks like just a nice square of stars coming up. And if you come off of the um, eastern end here, you kind of see um, a stars that almost looks like a, a Y coming off. But if you come off of the square and you go to count down two stars and then go up about two stars right in here is where the Andromeda galaxy is going to be. So it's just right in here. So Andromeda is the other large galaxy that is part of our local group of galaxies. So within our little local group we've got the Milky Way, we've got Andromeda, and then we've got a smaller uh, galaxy, probably a satellite galaxy of Andromeda called Triangulum. We have satellites, small satellite galaxies around us, as does Andromeda. And our two galaxies are slowly going to merge together, like I talked about earlier. Um, and when we do, in about 5 billion years, we'll mix it up and eventually become a, uh, an elliptical galaxy, probably. So, I mean, if you were able to live for the next 5 billion years, you would see the Andromeda galaxy getting larger and larger in the, in the night sky. And as, as, as it's approaching, just like the arm of the Milky Way um, arcing across, you might see another arm of the Andromeda galaxy as it gets closer and closer. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, right now it's about two and a half million light years away. So when Bernie gets the scope on it and we look at the light of the galaxy, you're looking at what the galaxy looked like two and a half million years ago. That's how long it took the light to get from our eyes. Um, now that's just a blink in uh, of time in cosmic time. That's nothing at all. But uh, you know, in our lifespan, it uh, it seems like a long time. Um, Andromeda is uh, usually you can see two uh, two of its small satellite galaxies around it as well. Um, they have Messier numbers as well, M32 and M110. Uh, um, Andromeda is slightly larger than our Milky Way galaxy. It's a, probably about you know, 130,000 light years across, where the Milky Way is about 100,000. The supermassive black hole, so most galaxies have large black holes in the center. And so our Milky Way supermassive black hole is about the sun size of 4 million suns. Um, so, you know, the, the black hole is just going to be a small you know, area, but that small area has the equivalent mass of four million suns. So that black hole combined with dark matter and dark energy and some of the other things kind of holds the galaxy together. Well, the Andromeda galaxy's supermassive black hole is about a hundred million solar masses. So it's much, much larger than ours. And so when, and when our two galaxies merge, and mix it up, those two black holes will eventually merge as well. And they'll be just become a larger black hole. The Andromeda galaxy is the furthest object you can see with your naked eye. 
So if you were in a fairly dark site, you look up visually, sometimes you have to use your peripheral vision. So you'd want to kind of look, follow the star hops and find out kind of where it's about where it's at. Look up at it and then just look off and kind of look back uh, out of it at the corner of your eye. You're going to see just a tiny little fuzzy spot. And that's the Andromeda galaxy. Um, like I said, it is, it is slowly uh, moving in towards us a little bit. It's, uh, we have our Milky Way galaxy. Um, you know, we looked at globular clusters earlier. Um, our Milky Way galaxy has about 160 to 200 globular clusters around our galaxy. Andromeda has about, I want to say it's about uh, 400, 460 globular clusters. Andromeda looks, uh, I mean, it, 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 you can see quite a bit visually through an eyepiece in a telescope with it. You can see the, the kind of the oval outline of it. If you've got some dark skies um, just with the eyepiece and you use your, again, use your peripheral vision, you can see a little bit of the spiral structure to it. Um, what Bernie's going to capture with his camera is going to be much more detail. You're going to see the spiral arms. You're going to see some color associated with it. You're going to be able to see a lot, a lot more detail. Um, when I talked earlier, um, this is in the vicinity of Cassiopeia, the, the queen. So this is the queen. Andromeda is the, uh, the daughter, the princess. And so uh, this is kind of um, where the arc of the Milky Way ends up as it arcs from Sagittarius over to um, Cassiopeia. And there it is. So the Andromeda galaxy is, uh, of course, the closest, largest galaxy to us at two and a half million light years. Um, and because it's as close as it is, it, the image of it is actually about five uh, degrees of arc, which is about 10 times larger than the, than the full moon. That's how big it is in the sky. So when you try to image it, it's hard to make it fit within uh, the image field uh, of the camera. And this is about as, about as much of it as I can fit in. Uh, here's the central core. That's where probably 50% or more of the stars of the Andromeda galaxy reside. And then spiraling around the central core, and you can see the spiral arms. Uh, with, this is a dust lane in between two of the spiral arms. So here's one arm here, and then there's another arm here, and they spiral around. You can see them kind of curving around this way and then coming back again. So it's a big spiral pattern in the sky. Uh, the galaxy also has a couple of uh, small uh, dwarf galaxies that uh, buzz around it. I don't see either one of them in this field. Uh -huh. So they must, be, they must be just outside of the field yeah. of view, unfortunately. But um, uh, typically, you see the other ones as well. Um, yeah, they're outside of the field of view. Uh, but we've got the spiral arms, and that's that's really the the most interesting part of the galaxy itself. Yeah, and you can really see the the core. You know, I mean, and like I was talking about earlier, the core. Um, probably a third to maybe even half the stars in the galaxy or reside in the core. So, um, and inside the center of that core is a supermassive black hole. That's that's uh, that's where the the black hole resides, and it's it combined with some other factors is uh, helping keep that galaxy uh, together. So that is Andromeda. Um, it's actually a difficult object to see in an eyepiece on a telescope because typically a telescope will, uh, because of its magnification, uh, will only show you the center core of it. And it can be rather disappointing to look at because it just looks like a big, a big fuzzball. Uh, to see it well, you need a really, really wide field uh, optical system. And 
the best thing that I've ever seen it with, other than with an imaging camera, visually is to actually have a very big set of binoculars um, that uh, have a, uh, like a five degree field of view. Uh, okay. Then it's much nicer to look at. All right, I think we're going to uh, call it quits there. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides uh, to wrap things up. And then I'll let uh, Bernie and Jim uh, say any comments. So um, again, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed our little tour around the night sky. We like, uh, we much prefer to be able to do star parties in person. Unfortunately, we can't right now. We've uh, done several uh, virtual ones. Um, and so we're, we are planning another one and I'll show you the schedule here in just a minute. Um, but I did want to kind of cover and show you what, uh, what, we've, uh, what we've done. So again, um, Bernie's telescope and camera, he's using a Celestron 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain with a Malin Cam uh, DS10C tech uh, camera. Um, the planetarium program that I was using is Stellarium. So you can get it downloaded free at stellarium.org. Um, I was in uh, Tucson, Arizona. That's where uh, the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association is. Um, Bernie is here part of the year, but right now he's up in uh, Minnesota. Um, and so he's actually at, the, he's a dual member with the Minnesota Astronomical Society. So he's at their dark site in Minnesota. Um, so my, the two gyms were the narrators, me and Jim O'Connor, and Bernie was the uh, telescope operator. Um, here's our website if, uh, if you need it for, there's, there's all kinds of information on the website. Uh, there's, uh, you can go there and, and there's a calendar so you can see upcoming both virtual and in-person events if you're in the Tucson area a lot of other help that you can get, things like that. Uh, obviously, you know where the Facebook uh, is if you're watching this on Facebook. We uh, try to uh, post you know, several astronomy-related posts throughout the month. So if there's anything cool to look at or something like that, if you uh, follow our Facebook page, then you'll uh, get updates on that. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. We're still in the process of developing that, but uh, if you go to YouTube and search, uh, I should say Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Um, and if you search that within YouTube, you'll find our channel. Um, this this um, virtual star party will be posted on there as well as some of the ones we've done in the past. And we hope to, to put some other ones on in the future. Here's some of our upcoming events. Um, again, if you're in the Tucson area and, and I don't know if we'll actually get these in in September or not, just kind of depends, depends on what's going on with the pandemic. But we do have uh, two scheduled at uh, fairly dark uh, parks. One's a uh, county park and the uh, Oracle State Park. We are planning another virtual star party October 9th at 7 p.m. Arizona time. That's Pacific Daylight Time. So uh, there will be a, uh, a Facebook event there as well as one on our our. Um, website but if you follow the Facebook event then uh, that way you'll get any notifications for updates and things like that. Uh, in the Tucson area in October we've got we usually do a big one in Catalina State Park we're doing one at Chiricahua National Monument another one at Agua Caliente one at Ironwood and then in November at Ironwood and Agua Caliente those were I'm not sure we'll get those in um, but if you again follow those events in the Tucson area, you'll get notified if we cancel them. We do have a, another virtual star party scheduled December 5th at 7 p.m. Arizona time. And we also have a couple uh, scheduled in December. Hopefully we'll get some of those in. Um, again, just follow the events when you, uh, when you get there. So with that in mind, let me stop the sharing. And so, um, again, uh, I'm Jim Noel, and I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. Uh, we like, we would prefer to be able to do the actual observing live, but because of potential weather right now, it's completely socked in here in Arizona. Um, we chose a night that Bernie was uh, capable of getting some good skies, and he obviously did, so that worked out really well. Um, so please, uh, you know, come and, and check out some of the other ones. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim O'Connor now and uh, see if he uh, has any parting words. This was a heck of a lot of fun and uh, look forward to doing it again. And uh, everybody go on out and uh, look up on your own, look up at the sky, see if uh, 
what you can find out of it and it belongs to you. Whatever you see, whatever you think about it, it's yours. Okay, and Bernie? Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, Jim and Jim, thank you for your time. Um, I'm one o'clock here in the morning, so I might uh, just stay up and 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 uh, do some more observing and watch the sunrise. Who knows? Uh, but, um, uh, been a, a really good evening and uh, exceptional skies tonight. I'm glad that uh, it worked out as well as it did. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. All right. Good night, everybody, and uh, we hope you enjoyed it.